Now, uh, I guess we can, one thing we can understand when we look at um, where we are as a people in the stream of time, we find various principles related in the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation as to God's ideal for his people, their apostasy, falling away from God's standard of righteousness and God's remedy. But when in those just simple three steps, we see uh, that there is the tempter, Satan, that creates this fall and he um, uh, seeks to uh, uh, bring God's people. Um, he fights against God's ideal. He, he, he instigates the fall of man and he then applies a false remedy for their solution. When you look at Adam and Eve, you look in the Bible, the book of Genesis, for the sake of time, won't go there, but Genesis 1, 2, and 3. We find that God had given man an ideal. God said that man could eat from every tree of the garden, Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would not eat of it, for on the day that they were to eat of it, death would be the result. We find that when we look in the Bible, uh, Romans 6 and verse 23, we see that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6 and verse 23, we find in James, no, 1 John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. For sin, we are told, is the transgression of the law. So we find that when Adam and Eve, the command that God gave to them was the foundation principle of the law. If you love me, John 14, 15, keep my commandments. We see the foundation, the principles of God's law. God gave a standard of righteousness. We find that Satan in chapter 3 instigated man's fall by insinuating doubt, by attacking God's standard of righteousness. We find that man fell, but immediately in that carnal mind, they began to go about a solution to the problem. And the solution they felt was a covering of their sin, glossing over, um, just, just hiding the shame and trying to keep it out of sight, you know, is is something that 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 should not necessarily be focused on. Let's 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 try to find something to cover it, and we will continue to go on doing what we should have been doing from the very beginning, in the Garden of God. But we find that the Bible tells us that in chapter three as well that the voice of God came walking in the garden, the word of God came walking in the garden, Christ in the cool of the day. And as they, his word, the gospel approached and began to this light began to magnify the condition of man, man found himself hiding. God did not come to comfort them or to suggest a different option, but God came and he showed them their condition and thus he began to implement their remedy. And this standard of remedy would cause them to have to strip themselves of their false, uh, this, 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 uh, uh, this false covering they would have to strip themselves of it in order to embrace the principles or the remedy that God had put in place. Now we find this same three steps, if you will, throughout the word of God. They are, they are much more, but I want to simplify it for this beginning presentation. We find the same thing. We move forward. We find the same thing in the days of Noah. We find the same thing in the days of Moses. We find the same thing in the days of 
Elijah, and so forth and so on. Throughout the Word of God, Christ came, John the Baptist, Christ, the disciples. It was all the same principle. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The axe must be laid to the root. You cannot look to who you are or what you think you are as an excuse or, or, or the remedy of solving your issues. There must be a repentance. Recognize the condition or the place from which you have fallen. Now, as it was in the days of Adam and Eve and all the way through, there was always a majority, a people who did not want to accept the true state of their condition. Adam, where art thou? He began to blame the church um, and so forth and so on. There was always blame that was there. Now we find that as it was, we, we fast forward again, there are various lines of reforms that God has given to us and, the, and we see these simple three steps. But I want to zero in on one for a moment. I want to look at Elijah's condition, all right? And I want us to notice what it says, El, the state of the church in Elijah's time, which God tells us Elijah is going to return before this great and dreadful day of the Lord. Not Elijah in, this, in the sense of Elijah, the prophet, um, this literal person, but this spirit, this power, that message, those steps of reform are going to be revived before God pours out his judgments upon the earth. Same thing with the children of Israel while they were in Egypt. But notice, let's move forward. Let's go to 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. All right, 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, one thing that we realize that with these steps, these simple three steps that we mentioned, God's ideal, man's condition, but as they fell away, that God would bring a remedy for the solution. Uh, the remedy included not only an awakening to their, to their current condition, that is revival. A revival is an awakening of your condition. But there was something that is connected to that that cannot be avoided. It is reformation. You cannot have revival without reformation. There must be reforms that must be put in. There is change that is implemented that, 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 that gives life to the revival. If the reformation is not attended to, then the revival will never have its desired effects. And if all the ingredients are not properly applied, then you will never get the results that God is looking for. We are satisfied with the results that we see Individuals would go and they would preach and, and some would come and down for the appeal. and There would be um, a big to do made of the baptism, but nothing put in place to continue the work of reformation. They're satisfied with a week or two weeks or three weeks or four. They're satisfied with this around of ceremony <clears throat> that gives some semblance of revival but because individuals are not, uh, are, are, are not keen to reformation, those things are avoided. But now I want you to notice in 1 Kings chapter 18, I want you to notice the principles that Elijah quickly put in place. I don't, I'm not saying he quickly put them in place, but we want to just brief, just go through them very quickly. In 1 Kings 18, I'm not going to read all of the chapter, but I'm just going to highlight various principles. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah has been hidden for three and a half years. He's working for God, but now God tells him to go to the king. It's time to bring the people back together. And Elijah comes out of his hiding place, as it were, and now Elijah is confronted by Ahab. And I want us to notice when, <clears throat> um, I want us to notice 
what it says in verse 17 of 1 Kings 18, verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now, Elijah points out what is the real condition of this falling away. Why are the people of God in apostasy? What is this dearth all about? Elijah says it is the condition of God's people. You read in 1 Kings chapter 8 when... Um, Talk to me. First Kings chapter eight, when Solomon prayed and he mentioned specifically that when the heavens are dried and when there is no rain due to the sin of my people, if they should turn and pray towards this place, hear thou, he says, in heaven. So he, so connected from the time of Moses, when you look at the book of Deuteronomy, Matter of fact, if you look at Leviticus 26, you look at Deuteronomy 11, Deuteronomy 28, you find that God has showed that as a result of apostasy, when God's people would fall away, everything in nature would be affected as a result. So here, it was not, it was not uh, 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 a surprise to Elijah that a famine came because this is what the word of God says. How was the famine to end? Not by b b uh, 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 putting their head down like a bulrush, not about praying and trying to smite with the fist of wickedness, not about going through these ceremonial uh, uh, cantations of praying for the latter rain, but it was bringing or turning God's people's hearts back to him. And this is what we find today in Adventism. This is what we find today in the evangelical Christian so-called Protestant community is that like the prophets of Baal, they are unwilling to meet the conditions and they believe if they just dance around the altar or if they just, if they just stand in the pulpits and talk about the latter rain, if they try to bring about these, these gatherings for the latter rain, then they believe that as a result of these heathenistic practices, that all of a sudden God is going to overlook this great apostasy that is seen in the churches and pour out his spirit just because we have designated a weekend for a revival or what we believe to be a revival. And so this is, this is the condition that we are confronted with today. You see pastors in Adventism dancing around as it were, not literally, but going around uh, um, 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 the altar as it were, going around the real issues and believing if they pray and talk loud for the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden God is going to give it to them. All of a sudden God is going to um, somewhat acknowledge it. If we believe that we can start our little ministries over here in the cave somewhere like Obadiah encouraged the, the prophets, if we can do that, then somehow or another we can avert the danger that the people of God are in. And we do not see it dumbing down in the least. You could turn on Facebook today and you could just scroll down your news feed and you will see this person has a ministry, that person has a ministry, here a ministry, there a ministry, everywhere you find ministries. And they're tucked away as it were in this cave and they're doing what they can to build up their their platform so that more people would take knowledge of what they're doing, 
But in reality, they're no different than the prophets of Baal who are dancing around the issues. So while Elijah now is going to call for this general assembly to put things back in order, Obadiah has people hid in the cave. We're not going to deal with that because that is not the purpose of this. Now, so Elijah says, no, it's, it's, I haven't done anything. He says the real condition is apostasy. Why are our schools the way they are? Apostasy. Why are people leaving the church in groves? Apostasy. Why is the church struggling to keep relevant with culture so she does not get sued? Apostasy. Why do we see the things that we're seeing in our homes? It is apostasy. We can focus on climate change and global warming, but again, the Bible shows it's apostasy. It says in the book of Romans 8, I believe in verse 22, that, 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 that um, nature is groaning, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. These things are birth pains signifying apostasy. Go to chap Joel chapter one. What was the condition that they found themselves in? Apostasy. Joel did not say we need to start uh, uh, recycling to, to avert the danger that is present. It was apostasy. Notice. So Elijah now calls the people. He calls for a meeting upon Mount Carmel. The various people began to go through their, the prophets began to go through their incantations and dancing and so forth and so on trying to give off and, and really trying to, to buy time that they could somehow come up with another way to bring about revival other than acknowledging the state of the church. And this is what you see. This is why many of you are frustrated when ministries on one hand speak of revival, but then turn around and tell you to go sit in an environment that kills, that is killing you. That is literally sucking the life out of you. And you don't understand when you're like, I don't get this. Yes, I believe what they say, but then they turn around and tell me to go sit in a place that has brought me in the state of my condition today, but they're telling me to go back. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not, I'm not getting this. And brothers and sisters, you can't make sense of it because again, if you would read, not to prove a point, but if you would read your Bibles to know Jesus, if you would pick up the conflict series to know Jesus, you could see the steps but the problem is we are only studying the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to substantiate our current condition and to, and to disprove someone else. This is why we keep missing the steps that God has given for revival because the revival is not going to start in the church. The revival is going to start in our own hearts. And this is why Revival is not taking place. And this is why individuals are grabbing whatever that would give off a semblance of revival, something that will, like Adam and Eve's fig leaf garment, that could cover up the dark void of their own life. And so they would cover themselves today with charts, and they would cover themselves with dates, and they would cover themselves with laws, and they will cover themselves with what the Pope is doing, and they will cover themselves with what secret societies are doing, and they cover themselves with what everyone is doing because there is something in their own lives that they're unwilling to recognize, and they look at all of these external things as a means to give them some revival instead of putting things in their proper place. And this is why so many people are frustrated. In the 80s and in the early 90s, it was the apostasies of the church that was giving people this false uh, sense of revival. But when all of a sudden that died away, then it was, you know, uh, uh, then, 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 then it was sort of a, a law for a moment. And now all of a sudden you find people jumping hold of 
uh, various winds of doctrine, 2520, and, and there, there are many others. I'm not just harping on the 2520, but it is that you have to be and remain in contact with the conference. All of these false ideas give off this cloak of revival, but it again, it does not meet the condition of the heart. And people are constantly being disappointed one after the other. Nothing is lasting because they don't want to look and put the things in their proper place. They don't want to deal with the cutting away like Elijah did when he went by the book Cherif, which means to be cut away. Elijah, though he had rebuked and though he had called down these judgments and though God was using him, there was still Elijah still had to go through his own experience of learning to trust and depend on Christ. Let's look. So, Eli so Elijah calls this general assembly and he allows the false prophets to, to work their, their, to work their magic. Nothing happens. But I want us to jump down to verse hmm, uh, after Elijah um, mocked them. I want us to notice what it says in verse 29. First Kings 18, verse 29. Again, if you're just tuning in, our theme tonight, we're dealing with Apost the Alpha and the Omega of apostasy and truly understanding the nature of our disease, the nature of our disease. Now, and here we are focusing just briefly on Elijah because we're going to move forward. Notice what it says. Verse 29 of 1 Kings 18, verse 29. And it came to pass when midday was past. And they prophesied until the time, notice now, until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regard it. Now, if, if you notice now, emphasis is placed upon they did this, the Bible says, until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. They stopped at a particular time. They were not in harmony with God's preferred plan that is outlined in the sanctuary, Exodus chapter 30, Exodus tw chapter 29 and chapter 30, that God had given a specific order in which worship was to be engaged and they did all they did until they cut off. There was a cutoff point for them because they did not understand the time. And this is why all that they did was out of order. There was neither voice, it says. They prophesied there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. There was, there was nothing. The people did not respond to this false Revival. There was no fruit of conversion. They were there. They were watching, anticipating that this would bring the revival. They went to these churches. They went to these camp meetings. They went there. They saw, they listened, they, but no fruit of the spirit. Nothing happened. They were excited as they saw all of this and heard these quotations and, and read these syllabuses and, and went through these various meetings from these individuals. They were followers of this person and followers of that person and they would drive to hear this and they would drive to hear that. But there was, there was nothing that came out of it. No fruit, no development of the character of Christ. Nothing began to... Uh, be stirred up in them that would bring about a desire to make known to others what a friend they found in Jesus. There was no missionary spirit. There was no beating from the new heart. They went down. They went in the water, maybe without self being crucified. And they came up with the same person they were. And they started adding beliefs by which you had to designate that you were a part of God's church or that you was a part of this latter day movement, but no fruit of the spirit, no new heart. 
people go to these meetings and come away with this idea that, you know what? There's nothing we need to do in the world. We just need to wait for the Pope and the evangelicals to decide when will be the day of revival. And so they sit upon their leaves. They're in a comfortable position waiting for some external laws to be written that was signified to them. Now it is time to work, but they'll be doing that in their own strength. And this is what we're seeing here. And this is what we're seeing today. Watch this. Verse 29. And Elijah, so now Elijah starts the word when? At the time of the evening sacrifice. Here it is. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired, notice now, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Wait a minute. There was altar already established. There was a, the, the, there was a quote unquote platform that they could have built upon. They could have, Elijah could have gone to their churches and Elijah could have ap appealed to their board of elders to let him use their pulpit. Elijah could have asked if he could uh, preach this Sabbath. Elijah could have um, 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 solicited and sent in his request to go to this particular vineyard. He could have waited for an invitation before he could go and preach. Elijah could have done that. But the Bible says he built up the altar that was broken down. Elijah was not concerned about their request. He was not concerned about their invitation. He was not concerned about preaching in their churches. Elijah prepared the altar that was broken down. Elijah went directly to the people. Notice, call the people to himself. Call them to himself, just like John the Baptist. He did not wait for the invitation. He did not wait to get a call. Elijah called the people to himself. I guess some would accuse him of trying to start something. The Bible says he repaired the altar. It says, and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be thy name. Notice verse 32. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and made a trench about the altar as great, as great as would contain two measures of seed. 33. And he put the wood in order. And many of us know the rest of the story. Elijah, as he put the wood uh, in order and as he as he repaired this altar, he grabbed these 12 stones and he raised up these 12 stones and he put the wood in order like Abraham put the wood in order. And as he put the wood in order, he had made the sacrifice put the sacrifice upon the altar and he asked for water to be poured upon and he asked for water to be poured upon. Um, and as this water was poured upon, Elijah prayed and said, Lord, let the people know that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And as he prayed, fire from heaven consumed the sacrifice because Elijah prayed. No, brothers and sisters, because Elijah had repaired the altar that was broken down. Elijah began to put things in their proper place. And as he put them in their proper place, then God heard from heaven. There were steps that needed to be taken in order to bring about the desired effect. And what was the effect? They now cut themselves off from these false prophets. They cut themselves off from these false prophets as a result of the revival. This is not even the reformation. This is still part of the revival. They cut themselves off from these false prophets. Now I want us to understand when we, when we're looking at what we're seeing here in this alpha, and omega of apostasy, understanding the true nature 
of our disease. And the problem is, brothers and sisters, we don't understand the true nature of our disease. This is why individuals can encourage you to sit in darkness, hoping that the Pope brings light. You say, well, how are they saying that the Pope will bring light? In other words, they believe that it is okay for you to sit in darkness until the Pope announces a Sunday law. And then when a Sunday law comes, that means now God, all of a sudden, as a result of the Pope's decree, is going to send you light. And now you can arise out of that darkness and stop going to those churches that are in darkness. But once again, if you read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy only to prove a point, you will continue to remain in darkness and confusion. You must not read the word of God to prove a point. You read the word of God. Christ has searched the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. What? But they are they that testify of me. Psalms 40 in the volume of the book, Christ says it is written of me. Thus, we must search the scriptures, not to prove points, but to know Christ and Jesus will lead us and guide us. That is the spirit's job to guide you into all truth. And many times as he guides you into truth, that which someone tried to use to hold you in a state of confusion, you can cast that aside. Many of the many, there are many syllabuses today that you would burn if you would just simply read the scriptures to know Jesus. But most people don't read the spirit of prophecy for that point. They read to substantiate their opinions and their positions. And many of us who are trying to search truth, start looking and reasoning from their confusion. And no wonder we end up confused. And so we can retain our bigotry. We can retain our selfishness. We can retain our, our, uh, uh, I, our own ideas about what we think is God. But now I want us to notice, let's see, where do we want to go? As we look at this condition, I want us to go in our Bible to the book of Isaiah. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter one, Isaiah chapter one. Let's go in our Bibles. Isaiah, the first chapter, because here Isaiah chapter one is going to give us an idea of the condition of God's people. And what happens is Isaiah is called to ministry. And as, as Isaiah moves forward to do the work of God, God begins to unfold to Isaiah the true state and nature of the church. In chapter three, the people feel as though that they are, they're proud, he says. They're haughty. They walk with stretched out necks. They're in a state of where they are comfortable. Why are people comfortable when their real condition is being brought to them or when their real condition, the word of God points out, but then how can they be comfortable? Because they have heaped to themselves teachers that will continue to foster and cater to an idea that they are not in need of repentance. So a little, maybe just a little bit of modifications here and there, um, but no real need to be alarmed. I heard a pastor once uh, a discussion was being uh, started as to documents that were being put out by the denomination. And he chimed in. No need to be alarmed. These things call for no alarm because they have become. They have been conditioned to ignore the remedy because it's too much. They feel. Is 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 it it would disturb their comfort zone if they would really deal with these particular issues, brothers and sisters. We're going to again touch on some of these things because we understand again apostasy, the alpha and the omega of apostasy, and looking at the nature of our disease. This thing was outlined 
for us in the scriptures and also by those whom God has raised up in these last days, they have shown what they saw coming to the Seventh-day Adventist church today. And the alarming part is we're carrying it out to the very letter. Notice Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one. God calls Isaiah, and I want us to look at verse two. And the message is here, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have noticed, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. You can look at the parable of Isaiah chapter 5. He planted them a noble and choice vine, but rather than bringing forth grapes, rather than bringing forth this, 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 uh, uh, Rather than bringing forth the truth of God's word that is not contaminated or fermented or mingled with the um, sour grapes of false teachings, God looked for these grapes that the blessing was in it, but rather he saw wild grapes that were tainted grapes, grapes that would cause an individual to become intoxicated if they partook of these grapes. How is it that, uh, that, that God could plant his people, this noble and choice vine, and rather than looking forth these grapes that bring forth blessings, that those who would come into the vineyard would end up drunk? How is it that they would come into the vineyard and begin to and end up drunk? But notice Isaiah 1. So he says, I've nursed, I've brought up children, and they have what? Rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. He says in uh, chapter verse five, why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt how often? More and more, he says. The whole, watch this, the state of the church, the state of God's people. He says this, the whole head is sick and the whole heart is Faint, verse 6, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is what? No soundness in it, but wounds, bruises, putrefying sores. They have neither been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Wait a minute. The Bible tells us that Jesus' ministry was to meet this condition. He mentions in Isaiah 61, he was to meet this condition. In Luke chapter 4, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, this was Jesus. Jesus needed, Jesus' ministry was to meet this condition and he was to bind it, fix it, pouring in oil and wine. And he would set this, set us on his own beast. He would bring us to where we could be nurtured and brought up and he would leave, as it were, something for the work to continue after he was gone. The Holy Ghost with the ministers who understood how to minister to the needs of those whom God was binding and healing. So we find that while this work of ministry Christ has left for his disciples, you have the priest and the Levite who are passing by on the other side, ignoring the state of the church while going to church, ignoring the real state of God's people. They see it. But you know what? It is not convenient to dwell upon these issues. It is not convenient or necessary to keep reminding the people of their condition. But why is it that God from Genesis to Revelation is reminding God's people of their condition? Because it is needful. Paul says, though you know these things, Peter, pardon me, says, though you know these things, 
I must put you in remembrance, he says, of them. So God shows us our condition. He points out this state. Jesus' mission was to bring about the desired effect that God needed to take place in the restoration of his people. He saw this apostasy from the head all the way down to the foot and all parts in between. God saw this condition. You know what the interesting thing is? As you continue to follow the narrative, Isaiah was also of this condition that God had called him to point out. But he saw the remedy. He realized in Isaiah 6 when he saw Christ that he was a part of the problem. Though God had called him, he was a part of the problem because he says, he said, man, I dwell in this nation and I am like them cut off. Here I am doing ministry. Here I am preaching. But yet it wasn't until I saw Christ. It wasn't until that I began to meditate on the things of God. It wasn't until I saw that Isaiah, the good king, as it were, I saw him cut off and I meditated upon his condition. In the year that King Isaiah died, Isaiah was a man who walked in the laws of God. He brought about reform, but in the latter part of his life, he put himself in a position God had not called him and he died a leper. And I'm sure that Isaiah looked upon that condition. He remembered, he saw what good works this man had done, but he saw that through this unadvised situation, he was, as it were, cast off. We don't know whether he repented or not, but Isaiah saw that God had brought judgments upon him. And I'm sure that Isaiah began to meditate and say, Lord, I can be doing all this and still be lost. I could have been preaching to others and myself in the latter part of my life become comfortable and fall away. But as he saw and pondered that condition, he began to see and his mind began to pierce through the veils that sin and the carnal heart had put up and God began to remove the veils and Isaiah saw Jesus and he realized at that moment he was no longer comparing himself among himself or with his brethren and he realized he was lost just like them. But it was when Jesus removed his iniquity, Isaiah acknowledged his lost condition. He acknowledged that he was undone. He was cut off. And as he acknowledged his condition, Jesus was able to move and remove the draws from his own life and to put this coal and wipe away his iniquity. Now Isaiah was in a position to go and preach who? Christ and show others Jesus is high and lifted up. And now he is known as the gospel prophet. Watch the point. So here in Isaiah chapter one, he identifies the state of God's people. He shows them their condition. And brothers and sisters, it is not a condition that one would covet, but it is a reality because this is our condition. There are wounds here. There are bruises. There are sores, oozing sores. This was the state of the man in Luke chapter 10. This was how he was found by the Samaritan. This is the condition that the priest and the Levite ignored. Why? Because they looked and said, he's not in our conference. They looked and saw, you don't pay tithe to us. They looked and saw, what, what, uh, who's your pastor? And because their names were not etched upon the church rolls and because no one in the church could vouch for their condition, they were left to suffer and linger in that condition. But brothers and sisters, don't fret because the Levites and the priest in Christ's time were more possessed and had more demons than the demoniac. But with them, the demons that possessed them pretended to be religious 
And so we find that they were in a worse condition than the man who was bruised. He saw his condition, but the Levite went to him. But the part of me, but the Samaritan began to bind up his wounds, move him into a condition. He didn't take him to the church. He didn't send him to the church. Why? Because he saw what the ministries had done to this man. They ignored his condition. He did not take them or send them back into the churches, but he took them someplace where they could be nurtured and strengthened. But oh, my friends, I want us to understand something. When we see this condition among the people of God, it is identified as well in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 down to verse 21. Now, I want us to understand the, uh, the alpha of the experience in which we as a people are experiencing. And I want us to notice there are a few quotations that I have outlined or that, have, that I've pulled together here. Um, because again, I've, 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 I started reading something. Pastor Kofi shared something with me. And um, I told him that I was going to uh, begin to um, elaborate, begin to deal with this particular subject. It's an interesting one. Because again, it shows how why we are experiencing some of the things we're experiencing. And uh, as we go through this next three messages, we hope that by the grace of God, that this could begin to help you to understand why individuals are as blind as they are. Now, not ignoring all the various things that we have done along these lines, with all the other videos that we have done, you could go to EG Bible School uh, YouTube channel and you can actually see where we have chronicled and outlined these things in many talks that we have done. Either uh, myself doing a round table with Pastor Kofor, Pastor Enriquez, but we have outlined these various things. Uh, so you will be able to look at any one of those videos at EG Bible School, that's our YouTube page. YouTube channel, and you'll be able to look at these things and put them in their sequence. But I warn you, I warn you that there's a reproach that will come as a result of having your eyes illuminated to the real state and condition that God's people are in. You've heard many sermons that people have done on the Elijah message, but it is with the hope that somehow or another that our ministers who have been trained up after the ways of Baal, our conference leaders who have been educated at Jezebel's table will somehow or another see light in your presentation and start bringing about changes. Did the people see light in Noah's message? No. Did the leaders see light in Noah's message? No. Did they see light in the, 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 the steps to reform that God had outlined in his ark? No. Did the leadership see light um, in um, the work of Moses? No, they didn't see light in that. Did the leaders see light in Elijah's message? No, they did not see light in Elijah's message and bring about revival or change. Did the leadership see light in Gideon's work? No, they didn't see light in his either. Um, did the leadership see light in John the Baptist and bring about serious changes that when Christ came, rather than turning over tables, Christ came and just encouraged them. No, they didn't see light in John the Baptist and brought about any significant changes. What about Jesus? No, they didn't see light in anything that Jesus said or did, and thus they hung him on a cross. What about the disciples? Did they, they had to see light in the disciples now. I mean, the disciples believed that they would see, eventually see light in them their ministry. No, they didn't see light. And, and as a result of it, they had to move their ministry from Jerusalem to Antioch and they were scattered everywhere preaching the word of God. Um, so the question is, and if you go through from uh, the seven churches, come down to Laodicea, if we don't see leadership seeing any light in any, uh, um, any reformatory movement since the days of Adam and Eve, then why is it somehow or another 
in the last stream of time, we believe somewhere down the line, our conference leaders and pastors are going to start seeing light in Reformation. You know what the deception is? Is because we have, or individuals, have crafted a remedy that keeps them in churches, and because they get invited to churches, they believe that they have a new way of bringing about revival and reformation that does not uh, uh, cause such pushback. And as long as they continue to do this, then they believe that they are going to do what Christ, John the Baptist, and Elijah, and the disciples could not do. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, this is why we must, again, go back to the beginning and read, not to prove a point, not to say, oh, he's right. Yeah, that's right. That's no read to know Christ. F follow him in the volume of the book. It is written of him. Follow him through these pages and you will see. Wow. I see why this can't work because it has never worked. The disciples tried it in Christ's time. Christ said it's not going to work. Notice. I want us to look at a couple of quotations before we close. All right. All right. So our next presentation is going to be, again, Alpha and Omega of Apostasy, the nature of our disease. And we're going to show where this Alpha began and show what this Omega is that the prophet says is more startling in its nature. It's more startling because it's not isolated in Battle Creek. It's not isolated with a school or one little hospital. It's not isolated with the church there in Battle Creek. It is something that is present from America to Europe to Asia into all the islands of the sea. And it has now become the standard of religion in Adventism. It is, it, we have come to expect apostasy in the church. You have a generation that is growing up in this apostasy and they see no danger in the fruits of the apostasy because the fashion shows is the fruit of it. The, um, um, the preth, plethora of women pastors is the fruit of it. What we see happening at our colleges, it's the fruit of it. What we see happening and what you see in your local church is the fruit of it. And what many of these supporting ministries are experiencing when they travel to all these churches is the fruit of it. And so this is why many of the supporting ministries believe if they could just pull off a couple of leaves, then that's going to begin the revival. The ax has to be laid to the root of the tree. You could pluck the leaves all you want. And so they do a week of prayer and pluck off some leaves. They go do another week of prayer and they pluck off some more leaves. And they're invited to do a two week meeting and they pluck off some more leaves. And they do a four week meeting and they pluck off some more leaves. And that's all they're doing is plucking off leaves. They pluck, just plucking leaves, but they won't let the ax hit the root. Why? Because they have already been put on notice that they are not ordained, nor do they have authority, nor do they have the right to question what the leadership does in this church. And if they want to continue to travel, then they must meddle in their own business. And this is why the supporting ministries are, have turned their volume down to hush mode. This is why they don't question anything anymore. They went from keeping, they went from keep not silent to staying silent. This is why things are the way they are. And this is why they're willing to talk to you secretly around the corner but you can never get them to preach it and say it from the pulpit because they have already been put on notice. If they want to continue their careers of getting money, 
soliciting money from the members, if they want to continue to be a part of this shell game, um, of this uh, money changer market system that has been developed in the church, if they still want to be a part of the money changers, then they must be silent. And they have accepted silence in exchange for being a marketer in the place and deceiving the people. So as we look at this, brothers and sisters, we, we are look at these in their principles and we'll outline them and we'll walk through it and we'll see exactly where we are today. Now, let me just read this and we will close for tonight. And this is taken from Selected Messages 197. It says this, Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha, when she's writing this, she says, we have now before us the alpha of this danger. And this is the whole Battle Creek Kellogg movement that came to fruition. The Omega will be of a most startling nature. As we said, it's not isolated at Battle Creek, it's everywhere. It's in all of our churches and all of our institutions. We see it every day. But I also want to read this part because I think it's also significant as well. It says this, and this is taken from Special Testimonies, August 27, 1903. False theories, false theories will be mingled with every phase of experience and advocated with satanic earnestness in order to captivate the mind of every soul who is not rooted and grounded in a full knowledge of the sacred principles of the, of the word. In the very midst of us, watch this, in the very midst of us will arise false teachers, giving heed to seducing spirits whose doctrines are of a satanic origin. These teachers will draw away disciples after themselves, creeping in unawares. Now, I want to focus. Why is it that they creep in unaware? It's because those who should be sounding the cry to these false teachers are in hush mode. Because they are part of ASI, and so is he, and so is she. And I can't say anything about them because I will get put off of ASI. I will lose the benefits of the money changers if I say something. I have to be careful in what I do because I could be pushed off of 3ABN. I won't be able to have my videos anymore being pushed anymore. I can, I, I have my series taken down from 3ABN if I should identify those for, so they exchange, so in exchange for being a watchman, they have accepted the office of a money changer in the marketplaces. And this is what they do. Whether they're preaching prophecy, whether they're talking about health, whether they're talking about education, it doesn't matter. They exchange the watchman's call for the money changers hall. And this is where they, this is where they prefer to be. Notice, creeping in unawares, they will use flattering words and make skillful present misrepresent misrepresentations with seductive tact. These things will be mingled with every phase of experience. And brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, we want to identify these movements. And you will see, by the grace of God, that many things that people have been using to keep you in this quiet, dormant, deluded state, you will see is satanic in its origin. And may God help us by his power to break from these demonic shackles before it is ever too late. Father in heaven. 
You've been listening to gospel media recorded by Everlasting Gospel Bible School with Pastor Darren Tinsley. To contact, support, or obtain similar media from Everlasting Gospel Bible School, contact us at P.O. Box 204-209, Augusta, Georgia, 30917, or call us at 706 706- 421-7719. And lastly, on the web, visit us at egbibleschool.org. Again, that's egbibleschool.org. May God richly bless you.